Hello, and welcome to this discussion about a multi-year project intended to strengthen communication and messaging during public health emergencies and provide health agencies with data-driven communication strategies. Three organizations partnered on this project. They are the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, the National Public Health Information Coalition, and the Harvard Opinion Research Program at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Funding and support for this project was provided by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We have three guests with us today to talk about the project and how it has benefited their public health communications. Dr. Jillian Steele Fisher is Deputy Director of the Harvard Opinion Research Program. Her team has provided public health agencies with critical real-time information about public attitudes and beliefs during the COVID-19 pandemic to support and enhance communication efforts. Dr. Mark Levine is the Vermont Commissioner of Health, and Nancy Erickson is the Communication Director for the Vermont Department of Health. Welcome, everyone. Let's begin with you, Dr. Steele Fisher. Can you tell us how your findings can help public health leaders communicate more effectively? Well, there are lots of kinds of data that are useful for communications, but I'm talking about opinion data. Now that is data about people's experiences, their perceptions, their intentions, their knowledge, and their reactions to our communications. All these pieces that help communicators and other state health leaders understand where people are at, what they're thinking. Now, our work is specifically focused on representative surveys, um, and those are the kinds of data that help us get an understanding of opinions with confidence about, let's say, how well they reflect the true population that uh, leaders serve. Um, And so we try to find out, you know, for example, like what fraction of people are hesitant about getting a vaccine. Um, But we also make sure that we understand why they feel hesitant. What beliefs and attitudes do they have about the vaccine? How common are misperceptions about the vaccine? How do people feel about the health agencies behind them? You know, um, these are the kind of insights that help public health leaders to develop effective communications. Everything from like specific campaigns and concrete messages to overarching frameworks. Um, It really makes it more likely that then people are receptive to the message. They're receptive to the information and hopefully can help make a are sort of are more motivated to make a decision that will help protect them and their family. And ultimately, I think this helps to create a more trusted connection between public health and the people that we uh, aim to serve and protect. Tell us more about the collaboration. What do you think makes it unique? This collaboration is unique in two ways. First, it's unique in the kind of data we share. I mean, there are definitely data sources out there about people's opinions. You can see polls in newspapers, for example. But the data in this project are specifically geared toward the needs of public health leaders and communicators. You know, we go beyond what media polls are doing because they're often really geared to making headlines and selling papers. (laughs) You know, they describe something big, like the fraction of people who say they trust public health institutions or support a certain policy. But they don't really tell you why. They don't really tell you more about, you know, the people who are behind that. Um, And communicators and public health leaders need to know why. And they need to know the views of the people behind it. They need to know what different parts of the population really experience, and they need to know what motivates them. Um, And what's widely available really doesn't do that. So this project is specifically geared to fill a really critical gap. Um, The project is is unique in a second way in that um, it partners data and guidance. So we actually have a series of workshops where we talk about each survey, not only to disseminate the data, but to work through what it means for communications, what it means for specific messages and frames and approaches. Um, and we get to work with different states, which is probably the best part of it. Can you provide some of your latest findings and explain how they can be applied in public health communication? So let's make this kind of real and talk about an example. So we conducted a survey of about 1,500 people across the country talking about the booster. Um, And so when we talked with folks and we asked um, those who were initially uh, eligible for the booster, we asked them, you know, how likely are you to get it? Um, And some people told us they'd already gotten it, but what we're really interested from a communication perspective is the people who haven't yet, right? And in a media poll, they're just gonna tell you like, well, these are the people who say they're never gonna get it, and this is why. It makes a really good story to talk about, you know, people who feel frustrated about vaccines. But from a communication perspective, we actually wanna talk with the people who are closer to getting it and understand their views. 
So for example, we asked people who said, yeah, I'm very likely to get it. And we're like, okay, well, it's been a couple months. Why haven't you? Right. And so that helps communicators make those connections. We asked them what that's like. And we found about, you know, a third of those said, yeah, I'm very likely to do it, but I haven't yet. And we said, okay, why not? Uh, and they told us some basic things that were really important for communicators to hear. Like, hey, I didn't know about it until today. Like, this is fundamental. We have an awareness issue with such a saturated media uh, and messaging sort of environment. People don't even know. So there's a really important um, dimension of just awareness. And secondly, people said, like, I know, but it's been really busy. And I don't know exactly when I'm going to get it. And so we needed to kind of engage with that, that lack of urgency and try to think about messages that can really help sort of pin people to a timeline, like, hey, you know, get this before the holidays, um, a way that we can turn their intentions um, that are good uh, all the way to action. Um, and so this is the kind of exploration that we can do in a survey that can really um, help a given agency work with, you know, the data to make a message that resonates and gets people from their good intentions all the way to shots in arms. Let's bring in Dr. Mark Levine from Vermont. Dr. Levine, how has data helped your agency's communications plans during the pandemic? From the starting gate, the governor and I were both in unison with the theme that we would be basing all of our decision-making and policy on science, and it would be data-driven using our Vermont data, and if we didn't have Vermont data, national or international data. And we communicated that really from the get go and continue to return to that theme all along. So when it came down to uh, should Vermonters get vaccinated, who should we vaccinate first, who is suffering most from the pandemic and needs to be protected the most in terms of vulnerability, we could present data on all of those points, making our decision about what policy we would follow very clear to understand because it was based on the data that we presented. So we usually just stood on that foundation of being data-driven and it paved the way to, I think, earning the trust of literally the entire Vermont population because the majority of them were strongly in support of everything we did during the pandemic. What were some of the communications challenges you faced responding to COVID-19? Yeah, you know, in the very beginning of the pandemic, the pace of events was so rapid. So just keeping up with that evolution of rapidly occurring events that we had to be informing the public about. As things got on during the pandemic, we had to coordinate a lot with other sectors and state government. And a lot of those sectors didn't have the same communications infrastructure that the health department had. We were able to uh, share resources uh, and marketing across government sectors, but that was a newer challenge for us as well. We had to be uh, true to our word and show that we have a very well-defined and experienced communication team and that they knew what they were doing. And then finally, we had lots of impacted communities defined geographically, but also defined by their particular characteristics. And we had to make sure our messages were effectively delivered to multiple types of communities. Can you tell us how your agency met those challenges? Well, first of all, like we do in public health all the time, we rely often on significant partnerships and trusted messengers. So there are many special communities. Some of them are defined by race, like the BIPOC community, where we had language justice project videos that we worked with. Others were defined perhaps by hearing status, uh, where we had videos through American Sign Language. Um, and we carried those themes through the pandemic to make sure that any special communities uh, had those challenges addressed. As we moved towards a phase of the pandemic where we actually were thinking about coming out of some of the more restrictive postures we were in, we had a team called the Restart Team that really addressed uh, all sectors of society, the socioeconomic, the business community, the school community, you name it. And we had our communications uh, team integrated into that process. So they had a level of awareness while things were evolving 
and could be, could be prepared to deliver the appropriate messages at the appropriate time. Nancy Erickson is Communication Director for the Vermont Department of Health. Nancy, what did you appreciate most about being involved with the project? Oh, the presentations by Dr. Steele Fisher um, on the most recent Harvard Opinion Research polls have been just invaluable. We've been able to use that information along the way to either confirm or question what we thought we knew about the attitudes generally. Sometimes this was state-specific information that really helped us too. Um, So that combined with the hard data we were getting from our data team on, you know, uptake of vaccine, um, that has continued to be really, really valuable for us as we continue to evolve our messaging. Um, The most recent example is our campaign on uh, COVID and promoting COVID and flu vaccines in preparation for the Winter respiratory season was really quite informed, shaped by the data we got from the Harvard poll. Also, the discussions with with other states on their communication strategies and and to meet, meet the challenges we've experienced along the way have been really helpful. What has been the impact of the information on your communications approach? Well, the most recent um, poll really pointed to some early warnings that we've been noticing too about changing changing support for childhood vaccinations after COVID. Um, and so that's been really, that really helps us to know that it's a real thing. I mean, I think we know that, but the data really supports that and leads us to some of the actions we can take to restore trust in public health and specifically vaccines. Can you imagine having had to deal with the pandemic without this kind of data at your fingertips? Well, that was really difficult because we didn't really have, you know, in the beginning, much information at all except except informally from what we were hearing through our channels. Um, And so really those, those national polls because we can trust that they're representative of the population. And it turns out for mom, we tend to think that we're special and we're unique, but we're really like everybody else, (laughs) especially in these kind of emergency or crisis situations. Dr. Steele Fisher, let's get your final thoughts. What lessons did the pandemic teach us about the role of data in public health communication? I think COVID has taught us how critical it is to stay connected to communities and how easy it is to get disconnected. The intense media coverage of COVID, the intense social media environment, I think it can make you feel like you know what people are thinking. Um, And it's really important to remember that the stories you see there don't reflect everyone. Um, They reflect interesting examples that sell. They reflect uh, people that are most vocal. They reflect the interests of the media organizations behind them. but what public health communicators and public health leaders need, um, they need that objective and rigorous data that gives a view of what people are thinking, feeling, and experiencing, you know, in a in a way that is reflective and broad and true, um, and ultimately more inclusive. Um, it helps us make sure that we hear people, we know how to reach them, so we can share information effectively. Um, I think, to me, you know, this kind of data is one key way that I always say we keep the public in public health. Nancy, what's your advice regarding data like that provided by the Harvard Opinion Research Project? Absolutely. Use it to, again, confirm or question what you think you know, because sometimes you're absolutely off target. Um, And use the hard data on uptake of the various kinds of things that you're promoting to um, really continue to shape and change the tone especially the tone as you're moving forward. And Dr. Levine, do you have any parting advice? Here's five pieces of advice. First of all, I hope you're blessed to have as strong and seasoned a communication team as I have. And if that's a weakness in your division, make sure you pay attention to that because you'll need them throughout. Number two, I would say, if you haven't already taken the course, take 
Crisis and Emergency Risk Communication 101. Um, it's critical to have that information and to behave as those principles dictate. That includes not only expressing empathy as a way to earn respect and trust, but also expressing humility, knowing that there were so many times we did not have all the information we needed, science didn't have all that information, and we needed to be patient, but offer our best appraisal. Thirdly, I would really recommend that anytime you've identified a population that you might think is more vulnerable or marginalized in any way, you, you pay special attention and reach out to that population. Fourth, I would think that having a governor like I did, who gives you the freedom to uh, deliver your messages, no matter how hard they are, and can help you with a unified message is really, really important. And lastly, try to show that you're working with a larger team, possibly a team just within health, but also a team across other sectors of government. And make sure that you deliver the primary message but that everyone else on the team has opportunities to synergize with that and align with that message so it's cohesively presented and repeatedly presented by a number of people. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to discuss the project with us. If you'd like to learn more about this work, you can visit the link or scan the QR code on the screen. Thank you for joining us, and have a great day.